If we go back in history, around the late 13th and early 14th century, we would come to know a vast empire of Mongols. When Genghis Khan rose to power in 1206, he sowed the seeds of the Mongol era. Due to their united policies, and ruthless wars, Mongols became able to control such an enormous area of land. Reaching the pinnacle in the 14th century, Mongols seized and annexed a number of other great empires in Asia and Europe. The Mongol Empire of the 13th and 14th centuries was the largest continuous land empire in history. Originating in Mongolia in East Asia, the Mongol Empire at its height stretched from the Sea of Japan to parts of Eastern Europe extending northward into parts of the Arctic, eastward and southward into the Indian subcontinent, mainland Southeast Asia and the Iranian Plateau, and westward as far as the Levant and the Carpathian Mountains. Hey everybody, welcome back to another Whispered Facts episode and today we are covering the topic of the Mongol Empire and this is a topic that I know next to nothing about so I'm really interested to learn more about this particular topic and I hope that you guys are as well and be sure to stick around until the end of the video as there will be five multiple choice quiz questions to test your knowledge on the video topic itself. So, once again, it's time to lay back, relax and let yourself drift away as I whisper facts about the Mongol Empire. was founded in 1206 when Demushin, son of a Mongol chieftain, assumed power and changed his name to Genghis Khan, styled as Genghis Khan in the West and meaning universal ruler. The young warrior had already defeated Mongols most powerful leader and fomented dissatisfaction among his people's aristocracy but he proved to be one of history's greatest leaders. At the time Mongolia's nomadic farmers relied on the land to sustain them. Their flocks of goats sheep, horses and other animals were dependent on abundant grass and water and Mongols had to travel frequently to sustain them. Droid and disease could wipe out their livelihoods quickly. Genghis Khan united Mongolia's tribes and supported China's peasant economy by stabilizing taxes and establishing rural cooperatives. He reformed his people's laws and ushered in a military feudal form of government. He embraced trade and religious freedom and adopted advanced technology of the time such as stirrups composite bows, leather armor, and gunpowder. And first of all, what I must add at this point of the video is that the 
chances are that I'm going to mispronounce some words in this video. I apologize for that, but I will do my very best to pronounce the words as best I can. Okay, so that was a very brief history on when the Empire was, was founded and how Genghis Khan came to be in power. And even though history is one of my weaker areas, I know who Genghis Khan was, obviously, which shows what an influential figure he was throughout history. After the British Empire, the Mongol Empire was the largest empire in the world during the time of its largest extent. It covered a vast area of 23 million square kilometers, about 16% of the total land area of the world. Wow, that is astonishing. Just over 16% of the world was once ruled by the Mongols. That is incredible. From 1207 to 1210 AD, Mongols carried out wars against the Western Xia, which ruled northwest China and some parts of Tibet. The Xia surrendered to Genghis in 1210. In 1211, Genghis Khan and his army crossed the Gobi Desert and fought against the Jin Dynasty in northern China. In 1215 AD, Mongols conquered Shangdu, the capital of the Jin Dynasty. Mongols were excellent horse riders swimmers, archers, swordsmen, spear hunters, etc. Due to their great soldiership, they had a fearsome reputation at that time. Yeah, so it sounds like they were just about the perfect warrior, you could say. success rested on a complex new military structure and new military tactics like arrow storms amassing huge arsenals engaging in repeated hit and run barrages delayed sieges and psychological warfare the warriors were assisted by new technologies like the stirrup and technological and tactical innovations they adopted from the people they conquered. Mongols were notoriously renowned for their ruthless nature in the battle. Wherever they went, they destroyed everything and mercilessly murdered people to conquer the kingdoms. Mongols were masters of strategies. During the time of battle, they made a perfect strategy to conquer other kingdoms, and most of the time, their strategies paid off. Their important step in the battle was to encircle and trigger the fear in the mind of the enemy. And I think that it must have been absolutely terrifi terrifying at that time for people in places that they invaded. You'd basically be living in constant fear, I think. I can't even begin to imagine the terror that people of that time felt. Mongols evolved in Eurasian steppes and mountains. They were born in harsh climates, varying from very hot to very cold. In childhood, they were taught 
reasons behind their success in creating a huge empire in Eurasia. According to the Guardian report, Genghis Khan and his army killed an estimated 40 million people during their war campaigns. Mongols were afraid of being taken over, so they exterminated many races across Eurasia. Yeah, so it sounds like they were so merciless because of the fear of losing the control that they, that they had, so they simply wiped out all that came before them. Despite its reputation for brutal warfare, the Mongol Empire briefly enabled peace, stability, trade, and protected travel under a period of Pax Mongolica or Mongol peace, beginning in about 1279 and lasting until the empire's end. Was a written law in the Mongolian society called Yasa, which was written by Tata Chungo, one of Genghis Khan's most loyal advisors. Its purpose was to maintain peace and order among Mongols. Mongols were wanderers by nature, so efficient communication between their leaders and officers was both vital and extremely difficult. They solved this issue by inventing a postal system called YAM. It was a fast collection of postal stations with dedicated messengers delivering mail, intelligence reports, and important news from station to station. These stations were about 24 to 64 kilometers apart and were kept constantly staffed. At one point, there were at least 1,400 stations in China alone, and the messengers had 50,000 fresh horses at their disposal. Wow, I love this fact and it makes a lot of sense. Obviously back at that time there were no phones or electricity so communicating over such a fast distance was difficult. So I think that's amazing that they set up this very well-run postal service to communicate. Say what you will about the Mongols, but it's clear that they were an incredibly well-oiled unit with everyone playing their part, which is why they were able to rule for such a long time and over such a vast area. Despite ruthlessness, Mongols were religious. Initially, they believed in Tengrism and Shamanism, Central Asian religions. However, later they converted into Buddhism and Islam. One of the most ruthless yet efficient parts of Genghis Khan's reign was the brutal conquest of the Silk Road, the main trade route between Asia and Europe, and one of the largest sources of income for the Mongol Empire. Realizing that even his massive army could not fully conquer and keep the 6,437 kilometer route 
he adopted a secondary strategy. Genghis Khan started destroying every single Arabic and Turkish settlement on the road until every city and oasis on the whole stretch was either in ruins or on their knees before him. This took a lot of time and he did not live to see his plan take full effect. But once the Mongols finally gained control of the route, they hung on to it. The Silk Road was entirely under Mongol control for the majority of the 14th and 15th centuries. Kublai Khan was the grandson of Genghis Khan who founded one dynasty and reigned between 1260 AD and 1294 AD. In 1269 he founded the Mongolian language school. The great traveller and explorer Marco Polo came to his court in the 1270s. He unsuccessfully invaded Japan two times in 1274 and again in 1281. Timur was the grandson who succeeded him as the next one emperor and the great Mongol Khan during the reign of Monkey and Kublai Khan, art and architecture flourished. They emphasized the Mongol and Persian architecture around in modern day Mongolia and China and focused on the construction of the monasteries, buildings, mosques, roads, canals, trade routes and other infrastructure. Historians tend to portray Mongol men as fearsome and mighty conquerors, but the women are often ignored. In the Mongol civilization, it was actually the women who called the shots. While their men were busy fighting battles, the women kept the economy going and held some of the highest positions in their shamanistic religion. This put the Mongol ladies in a position of power that their European contemporaries could only dream about. I think this is an interesting point and a very important point as well because what I have seen of Mongols in movies and TV is very heavily focused on the men, particularly the warriors. So it's interesting to hear that the women in fact played a very important role. The Mongols decided very early on that in order to conquer a giant empire, they had to accept the habits of the people they conquered. They were happy to let their subjects keep their religion and important cultural habits and actually actively encourage this with things like tax reductions for priests. Since Mongols themselves had a very open and relaxed attitude toward the religion. This cost them practically nothing and provided a valuable tool in keeping the conquered nations content. Mongols were occasionally referred to as Tatars or Tartars by the people they terrorized. This was originally derived from Tsatsa. However, when people realized this sounded a lot like Tartarus, Roman mythology,
mythology's variation of hell. They started calling Mongols Tatars, meaning demons from hell. The Tatar name is still in use, though it is not quite as threatening anymore. Today, Tatar refers to ethnically Turkish people who live in Russia, Kazakhstan, and Siberia. Yeah, I think that is pretty terrifying to be honest, but very accurate at the same time. Ming Dynasty of China took over the Wan Dynasty, which was founded by the great Mongol leader Kublai Khan, and this caused the end of the Mongol Empire in 1368 AD. Alright, so that concludes the facts portion of the video, and now we move on to the five multiple choice quiz questions, and I wish you the best of luck. So, question one. According to the Guardian report, Genghis Khan and his army killed an estimated how many people during their war campaigns? Was it 20 million, 30 million, or 40 million people? said 40 million. Well done, you are correct for the first question. Question 2. What was the name of the vast collection of postal stations set up for communication across large distances? Was it Yam? Spelled Y-A-M. Tam spelled T A M or Sham spelled Z H A M and the correct answer for this question is Yam. So well done if you got that one correct. Question three In what year did Kublai Khan grandson of Genghis Khan found the Mongolian language school. Was it 1259, 1269, or 1279? And that's quite a tricky one there, I think, but if you said 1269, then well done, you are correct. Question 4. In what century was the pinnacle of the Mongol Empire? Was it the 12th, the 13th, or the 14th century? Well, if you said the 14th century. Well done on that one, you are correct. And finally, question 5. About what percentage of the earth did the empire cover at the peak of its reign? Was it 12%, 16%, or 20%? And if you said 16%, well done, you finished with a correct answer. RMS Titanic was a British passenger liner operated by the White Star Line, which sank in the North Atlantic Ocean on the 15th of April 1912 after striking an iceberg during her maiden voyage from Southampton, England to New York City of the estimated 2,224 passengers and crew on board more than 1,500 died which made the sinking possibly one of the deadliest for a single ship up to that time it remains to this day the deadliest peacetime sinking of a superliner or cruise 
ship. The disaster drew much public attention, provided foundational material for the disaster film genre, and has inspired many artistic works. Hey fact friends, a big welcome back to the channel and welcome if this is your very first time here. Today's topic of conversation is the world famous ship, the Titanic, possibly the most well known ship in existence. So I'm very excited to put this video together for you guys and learn a little bit more about the fateful ship that sank to the bottom of the Atlantic 110 years ago. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video when there will be a five question multiple choice quiz based on the information given throughout the video. And I wish you the best of luck with that. It should be fun. So guys, get comfortable, lay back, relax, and let yourself drift away as I whisper facts about Titanic. RMS Titanic was the largest ship afloat at the time she entered service and the second of three Olympic class ocean liners operated by the White Star Line. She was built by the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast. Thomas Andrews, who was the chief naval architect of the shipyard at the time, died in the disaster. Okay, so yeah, it's well known that Titanic was built here in Belfast, where I live, at the Harland Wolf shipyard, and it's something that we are very proud of where I come from, and we even have a museum here dedicated to the Titanic, which is an amazing place. If you're ever in Belfast, I highly recommend you visit the Titanic Museum. You will not be disappointed. Titanic's construction cost was 1.5 million pounds, which is around 170 million pounds in today's money. It took around three years to build. The wages of those on board varied greatly depending on position. Captain Smith earned 105 pounds per month, about 11,000 pounds today whereas a stewardess earned three pounds, ten shillings per month, which is around 375 pounds today. Okay, so that gives us a bit of an idea of some of the numbers behind the construction, as well as the wages of the captain and crew, and that is a significant significant gap between the captain and a stewardess, the equivalent of a gap between 11,000 pounds and 375 pounds today, which is quite a significant one. The Titanic was supposed to be an unsinkable ship, and it was built to monumental scale. In total, it was 882.5 feet long, 92.5 feet wide, and 175 feet high. It would displace 66,000 tons of water, and it was the largest ship built up to that point in time. Queen Mary cruise ship was built in 1934 and surpassed the Titanic's length by 136 feet, making it 1,019 feet long. In comparison, the Oasis of the Seas, a luxury liner built in 2010, has a total length of 1,000. 187 feet. That is nearly a football field longer than the Titanic. Yeah, and I've actually seen pictures 
seas compared to the size of the Titanic and it is absolutely massive. They aren't so much cruise ships as they are almost floating hotels. They are really something to behold. So yeah, the difference in size between cruise ships today and the Titanic is quite significant. Luxuries for the first class passengers included a swimming pool, a Turkish bath, a squash court, and a dog kennel. The Ritz restaurant on board was inspired by the famous Ritz in London's Piccadilly Circus. The Grand Staircase. There were several staircases descended seven of the ship's ten decks and featured oak panelling and bronze cherubs. A replica of the staircase can be seen at the Titanic Museum in Branson, Missouri. Yeah, and I believe the Titanic Museum in Belfast, which I've mentioned already, also has a replica, though I'm not sure if it's a complete replica or not, but I have seen pictures of it online. I've actually visited the museum and it's really impressive, as I mentioned, and it's something that Belfast is very proud of, and in general the city is very proud of having built the famous ship. There's a saying that I've heard before, I'm not sure I should say it for fear of offending someone, but the saying goes, Titanic built by the Irish, sank by the English, and I really hope nobody is offended by that. It's just something I have heard before, but anyway, it's cool to learn about some of the luxuries about the ship as well. It's interesting that it had a swimming pool, which I haven't actually seen before. Titanic wasn't full when it set sail and could have had another 1,100 people on board. It was a luxurious ship and tickets were expensive. A third class ticket cost around £7 in 1912, which is nearly £800 in today's money. A second class ticket cost around 13 pounds or nearly 1,500 pounds today and a first class ticket would have set you back a minimum of 30 pounds or more than 3,300 pounds today. Wow, those prices for tickets are extremely expensive and it makes me think about Concord ticket prices. I believe they were in the thousands as well. And I did a, a recent video on the Concord and facts about the history of Concord. So if you're interested in checking that video out, I'll put a link down in the description. But yeah, those prices were extremely expensive, as you would imagine, with it being such a luxurious ship and with so many people wanting to be on the maiden voyage of it as well. The lifeboats on the Titanic were equipped with tins of crackers and water, but the survivors did not know about them, and most did not discover them. The Titanic burned about 600 tons of coal each day to keep it barred. A team of 176 men kept the fires burning and it is estimated that over 100 tons of ash were injected into the Atlantic each day the Titanic operated. 100 tons of ash, that is phenomenal. A very expensive ship to run to sail on and also expensive for the environment, you'd have to say. The 
ship's chief baker nonchalantly stepped off the stern of the sinking liner and calmly paddled around until dawn. After he was rescued, he was back at work within days. Experts note that he survived history's greatest maritime disaster by getting completely drunk. And I'm pretty sure this was a part of the 1950s adaptation of the sinking. I believe it was called A Night to Remember and I actually watched that movie in English class at school and remember that part of the movie though I have seen large parts of the movie since um, not that many years ago in fact but it's not something that was really touched upon in the 1997 version though he does make an appearance I believe when the ship is going down he can be seen next to Jack and Rose sipping on his little canteen of alcohol as the ship is in its final moments the last dinner served to first class passengers at the Ritz restaurant was a feast with ten sumptuous courses featuring oysters, caviar, lobster, quail, salmon roast duckling and lamb. On board the Titanic were 20,000 bottles of beer, 1,500 bottles of wine and 8,000 cigars, all for the first class passengers. Of the over 1,500 people who died when the ship sank, only 337 bodies were recovered. Originally, a lifeboat drill was scheduled to take place on board the Titanic on the very day that the ship hit the iceberg. However, for an unknown reason, Captain Smith cancelled the drill. Many people believe that had the drill taken place, more lives could have been saved. It's funny sometimes how life has a way of making you regret certain decisions and I'm sure the captain regretted that in the lead up to the sinking and his own death as well. But yeah, it's quite amazing that, that that happened and there was a drill planned for the very day that the ship struck the iceberg. There was an eight-piece band on the Titanic led by violinist Wallace Hartley who had to learn 350 songs in the songbook handed out to first class passengers. As the Titanic was sinking, they sat on the deck and played music, and all of them went down with the ship. Survivors reported that the last piece they played was either Near My God to Thee or a waltz named Autumn. As we read these facts, or some of these facts, is anyone else picturing parts of the movie, or is that just me? <laughs> A lot of these facts will have been contained within the motion picture, as it was incredibly detailed, of course, one of the best movies I've ever seen. And it's one that I'm always happy to watch if I catch it on TV, even though it is around three hours long. It's for sure the most compelling movie of that length I've ever seen and one I can easily sit through and not lose interest for a second. But yeah, whilst reading these facts I am getting images from the movie in my head. From the time the lookouts sounded the alert, the officers on the bridge had only 37 seconds to react before the Titanic hit the iceberg. In that time, First Officer Murdoch ordered hard a starboard, which turned the ship to port. He also ordered the engine room to put the engines in reverse.
universe. The Titanic did bank left, but it wasn't quite fast or far enough. The Titanic was designed so that four forward compartments could fill with water without sinking the ocean liner. Six flooded on the night she sank. And this was another part touched on in the movie. I five compartments were filling, therefore the fate of the ship was sealed. That moment when they are all standing around and they realize that the ship will sink and hitting the iceberg wasn't going to merely slow them up. Not only were there not enough lifeboats to save all 2,200 people on board, most of the lifeboats that were launched were not filled to capacity. If they had been, 1,178 people might have been rescued, far more than the 705 who did survive. For instance, the first lifeboat to launch, Lifeboat 7, from the starboard side, only carried 24 people, despite having a capacity of 65. However, it was Lifeboat 1 that carried the fewest people, a total of 12 people, despite having a capacity for 40. Of the 35 engineering staff on the Titanic, none survived. They all fought to keep the ship's bar on so that others could escape. That's quite a, a sad fact really. They stayed as long as they could, I believe, trying to reach somebody using the, the old Morse code and they really were dedicated to their roles, even in the face of death. When the ship began sending out distress signals, the Californian, rather than the Carpathia, was the closest ship. However, the Californian did not respond until it was much too late to help. Crew members on the Californian saw mysterious lights in the sky where the distress flares sent up from the Titanic and they immediately woke up their captain to tell him. Unfortunately, the captain issued no orders. Since the ship's wireless operator had already gone to bed as well, the Californian was unaware of any distress signals from the Titanic until the morning. By then, the Carpathia had already picked up all of the survivors. Many people believe that if the Californian had responded to the Titanic's pleas for help, many more lives could have been saved. Despite the fact that everyone knew the Titanic sunk and they had an idea of where that happened. It took 73 years to find the wreckage. Dr. Robert Ballard, an American oceanographer, found the Titanic on September the 1st, 1985. Now, a UNESCO protected site the ship lays two miles below the ocean surface, with the buoy nearly 2,000 feet from the ship's stern. I've seen footage of this, as I'm sure a lot of you watching will have as well. I love seeing the real-life footage of the wreckage, but I'm not sure that I'd enjoy being down there myself, knowing how far down it is and how much pressure there is outside on the glass. Another fact mentioned in the 
ship lies at a point 12,500 feet under the ocean, approximately 370 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. Yeah, and I just talked about this a minute or two ago, just how deep it actually is. I love the Titanic, but I'm happy to watch footage and think about it from up here on dry land. Among the famous people who died on the Titanic, the wealthiest by far was John Jacob Astor IV, who was worth over $90 million, over $2 billion in today's currency. Others included the mining heir Benjamin Guggenheim and engineer Thomas Andrews, who oversaw the construction of the Titanic. The co-owner of Macy's department store, Isidore Strauss, and his wife Ida also died on board the ship. Dorothy Gibson, an actress who survived the sinking of the Titanic, later starred in the first motion picture based on the disaster. That's a, a cool fact and something I wasn't previously aware of. I'm not sure exactly how many motion pictures have been made, but I know there is at least two, or pre I did know there was two, and now I know there was three. I think there is also a TV series. In fact, I know there was a TV series, and it was a British TV series that was produced maybe 10 years ago, as of the recording of this video. I vaguely remember it on TV, but I didn't watch it. But yeah, I'm sure there have been a number of adaptions of the disaster. On April the 17th, 1912, the day before survivors of the Titanic disaster reached New York, the CS McKay Bennett, a commercial cable repair ship, was sent off from Halifax, Nova Scotia, to search for bodies. Although the McKay Bennett found 306 bodies, 116 of them were too badly damaged to take all the way back to shore. Attempts were made to identify each body found. Additional ships were also sent out to look for bodies. In all, 328 bodies were found, but 119 of these were so severely degraded that they were buried at sea. Australian billionaire Clive Palmer is building Titanic 2, a close replica of the original. The project, however, has had many delays and the ship is yet to launch as of 2022. I have to admit, when I read this fact, I had to pause for a few minutes to look up information on it. And it's easily the fact in this video that I find the most intriguing, the fact that an actual replica is being built with subtle differences, but nonetheless it's a really cool fact and it will be amazing when it's finally complete. It'll be like almost going back in time when you see it, I think, and I'm very excited when it is complete. Scientists believe that the wreckage of Titanic could vanish by 2030 due to bacteria eating away at it. In what is now an iconic image, the 
side view of the Titanic clearly shows four cream and black funnels, while three of them released steam from the boilers. The fourth was just for show. The designers thought the ship would look more impressive with four funnels rather than three. Wow, that is something I did not previously know. So the fourth funnel was in fact just for show. That is really cool and I believe they probably made the right choice. It may have looked a bit bare with only three funnels. So yeah, I think it looked amazing with the fourth funnel added. While the promenade suites in first class had private bathrooms, most passengers on the Titanic had to share bathrooms. Third class had it very rough with only two bathtubs for more than 700 passengers. Only two baths for 700 people. That is cost cutting in the extreme, you would have to say. Pretty inhumane almost in a lot of ways. Something that you would never get away with today. It's one of the things I remember clearly from my last visit to the museum. You get to see what a typical first class, second class and third class cabin look like. So yeah, it was something really interesting to see. The iceberg that sank the Titanic was about 100 feet tall and came from a glacier in Greenland. The last words of Edward Smith, the ship's captain, were, Well boys, you've done your duty and done it well. I ask no more of you. I release you. You know the rule of the sea. It's every man for himself now, and God bless you. The Titanic seemed to have everything on board, including its own newspaper. The Atlantic Daily Bulletin was printed every day on board the Titanic. Each edition included news, advertisements, stock prices, horse racing results, society gossip and the day's menu. Masa Bumi Hosono was the only Japanese person on the Titanic. While he survived the wreck, the Japanese government condemned him for not going down with the ship. That's a, a pretty strange reaction from the Japanese government, like he is in some way to blame for not dying. Very strange indeed. On board the Titanic was a sea post office with five mail clerks, two British and three American, who were responsible for the 3,423 sacks of mail. Interestingly, although no mail has yet been recovered from the wreck of the Titanic, if it were, the US Postal Service would still try to deliver it out of duty and because most of the mail was destined for the US. Anne Elizabeth Isham reportedly jumped out of a lifeboat once she realized that she couldn't take her great din with her. She later died. Ah, oh, as a huge dog lover myself, I know how hard it must have been for the people who lost their dogs or had to leave them behind and obviously this person mentioned in this fact simply couldn't leave her dog behind. Her love for the dog was too strong. Around 
87% of the 144 female first class passengers were rescued, while 32% of their 175 male counterparts were saved. Male second class passengers had the worst survival rate, with only 14 out of 168 making it out alive. And finally, after Titanic sank, the first International Convention for Safety of Life at Sea was held in 1913. The convention required that every ship have lifeboat space for each person on board, and that lifeboat drills should be held. It also required that ships maintain a 24-hour radio watch. Alright guys, that concludes the facts portion of the video. So now we move on to the 5 question multiple choice quiz. I wish you the best of luck. So, question 1. What was the cost of Titanic's construction? Was it 1 million, 1.5 million, or 2 million pounds? And the correct answer there is 1.5 million, equivalent to around 170 million in today's money. Question 2. Of the over 1,500 people who died when the ship sank, how many bodies were recovered from the water? Was it 331, 334, or 337? And if you said 337, you are absolutely right, which is an astonishingly low percentage of people who perished. Moving on now to question 3. By what year do scientists believe that the wreckage of Titanic could vanish by? Is it 2030, 2040, or 2050? And the correct answer there is 2030, which is really not that far away at all. It's hard to imagine that the wreckage will completely vanish in the next handful of years. So, question 4. Of the nine dogs on board the Titanic, only two were rescued, a Pomeranian, and what other breed? Was it a Labrador, a West Highland Terrier, or a Pekingese? And well done. If you said a Pekingese for that question, you are absolutely right. And finally, question five. The Titanic seemed to have everything on board, including its own newspaper, but what was it called? The White Star Line Bulletin, the Atlantic Daily Bulletin, or the Titanic Bulletin? And the right answer there is the Atlantic Daily Bulletin. So, well done if you finish the quiz on a high. The Mafia has been a source for inspiration and fascination for over a century. It frequently appears in movies and books, either as the main focus of the story or as a way to add spice to it. It has become as much of a part of the American
American history as cowboys and Indians or Western expansion. In stories, mafiosi are as often heroes or at the very least anti-heroes as they are villains. They are frequently romanticized and their associated code of honor makes it easy to view them in a positive light. Hey fact friends, why is everybody doing today? I hope you're well and feeling rested, ready for another Whisper Facts episode, which today is going to cover the topic of the Mafia. This was a viewer requested video, so if you have any topics you'd like to see covered on the channel, be sure to post them down below in the comment section and I will see what I can do. Alright, so without further ado, it's time to lay back, relax and let yourself drift away as I whisper facts about the Mafia. A Mafia is a type of criminal organization whose central activity is the arbitration of disputes between criminals and the organization and enforcement of illicit agreements through the use of violence. Mafias often engage in secondary activities such as gambling, loan sharking, drug trafficking, prostitution and fraud. The term Mafia was originally applied only to the Sicilian Mafia and originates in Sicily, Italy, but it has since expanded to encompass other organizations of similar methods and purpose. For example, the Russian Mafia or the Japanese Mafia. The term is applied informally by the press and public. The criminal organizations themselves have their own terms. For example, the Sicilian Mafia and the related Italian-American Mafia refer to their organizations as Cosa Nostra. The Japanese Mafia calls itself Ninkayo Tantai, but is more commonly known as Yakuza by the public. And Russian Mafia groups often call themselves Bratva. When used alone and without any qualifier, Mafia or the Mafia typically refers to either the Sicilian Mafia or the Italian American Mafia and sometimes Italian organized crime in general. I must admit, I know very little about the Mafia, so I'm going to learn a lot from this video. I don't know about you guys, but for me personally, I really I don't know a lot about it. So it's pretty much going to be all new information to me, but that is something I love about making these videos. Not only do you guys get to learn and hopefully relax to my content, but I also get to learn. So there are lots of benefits to these videos. The American Mafia, commonly referred to in North America as the Italian American Mafia, the Mafia or the Mob, is a highly organized Italian American criminal society and organized crime group. In the United States, emerged in the poverty stricken Italian immigrant neighborhoods or ghettos in New York's East Harlem, the Lower East Side and Brooklyn, also emerging in other areas of the East Coast of the United States and several other major metropolitan areas such as New Orleans and Chicago. During the late 19th century, 
19th century. Following waves of Italian immigration, especially from Sicily and other regions of southern Italy. Okay, so here we learn that the Mafia in the US began in the late 19th century, primarily in the New York area, but a sprinkling of other major cities as well. So that's a brief history of when and where the Mafia began in America, which is probably the one most of us are familiar with thanks to such movies as The Godfather. And whilst we're on the topic of The Godfather, I have to admit I tried to watch it, but I did end up turning it off after a point. It was probably about an hour, which I may get some heat for doing, but honestly, I could see how well made it was. It just wasn't my kind of movie is all I would say. The part I recall most clearly is when the guy wakes up in the morning and there's a horse's head in his bed. That was pretty graphic, but yeah, if you're a fan of the Mafia, you no doubt love the Godfather movies. I just have to be honest and say it wasn't for me, but I do have an interesting fact for you about the movie that you may or may not know, but The Godfather does not contain the words Mafia or La Cosa Nostra because of a deal struck between the producer and the real Mafia. I would love to have seen how that meeting went and how they came to the agreement. The American Mafia is divided into different groups or families. Many large cities have only one Italian American Mafia family, but some larger cities like New York City have more. New York City has five Italian Mafia families who are as follows and I will do my best to pronounce these names correctly, but I can't promise that I will. So first of all, we have the Bonanno family, B-O-N-A-N-N-O. Secondly, we have the Colombo family, so that's a bit easier to pronounce the Colombo family. Third, we have the Gambino family. The Gambino family. And the final two are a lot more difficult to pronounce, but I will have a go. And the fourth family is known as the Genovese family. The Genovese family. And that is spelled G-E-N-O-V-E-S-E. -E -E. And the final family on the list is the Lucese family. And that is spelled L-U-C-C-H-E-S-E. -E, the Lucese family. And what is shocking to me is that the Mafia still exists. I mean, I had no idea that they were still in operation today, but again, it's it's not an area I pay any real attention to. However, that fact does surprise me. The Mafia is currently most active in the northeastern of the United States with the heaviest activity in New York, Philadelphia, New Jersey, Buffalo, and New England. In areas such as Boston, Providence, and Hartford. It also remains 
means heavily active in Chicago and has a significant and powerful presence in other Midwestern metropolitan areas such as Kansas City, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and St. Louis. Or perhaps that's pronounced St. Louis, but I know it's in Missouri. Outside of these areas, the Mafia is also very active in Florida, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles. Mafia families have previously existed to a greater extent and continue to exist to a lesser extent in northeastern Pennsylvania, Dallas, Denver, New Orleans, Rochester, San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, and Tampa. While some of the regional crime families in these areas may no longer exist to the same extent as before, descendants have continued to engage in criminal operations, while consolidation has occurred in other areas with rackets being controlled by more powerful crime families from nearby cities. So, in the US at least, the Mafia were and are quite widespread. I mean, there are a lot of different cities and states covered in that list. Probably a lot more widespread than I ever would have imagined. Just like in a company where people have a boss and workers, the Italian-American Mafia has a hierarchy. Everyone has a job to do. Some people are bosses and some are workers. However, you can always work your way up the ladder of bar and respect. Below is the hierarchy of an American Mafia family. So first of all, at the very top we have the boss of the family. He controls the Mafia family. Every worker and lower ranking boss works for him. It is the boss who decides if someone should be killed or if someone should be initiated. The boss gets money from all of his workers and therefore is usually the richest person in the family. And just below the boss we have the underboss. The underboss is the person who actually runs the family. He is boss over all the other members except the actual boss. He will often become the head of the family if something happens to the boss. And next we have the consigliere. The consigliere. Consigliere is an Italian term meaning someone who gives advice. The consigliere in a mafia family is the right hand man to the boss. It is his job to help make important decisions. The consigliere is as important as the underboss, but is not in charge of anyone in the family. A family will usually have only one consigliere. The consigliere acts as a middleman in personal vendettas. His role is to make impartial decisions for the family's benefit. And below the consigliere we have the capo regime. The next position of the family is the capo regime or captain, often 
shortened to capo. Families will have different numbers of capos. They are in charge of a group of workers known as soldiers. The underboss of the family is in charge of the capos. The job of the captains is to collect money from the workers to give to the boss, underboss and the consigliere as well as keeping money for himself. A family can have anywhere from 2 to 20 capos. And finally we have the soldiers. The workers of a family are called soldiers or in Italian soldati. Their job is to earn money to give to their capo regime. They will do any job asked of them by their captain or the boss or underboss. A family can have anywhere from 10 to 1000 soldiers. This is my favorite part of the video so far, learning about the different roles within the Mafia and how efficiently run it is. I can literally picture scenarios when someone doesn't do their job properly, probably a soldier, and then they face backlash over it. And it's not like if you make a mistake in a regular job, I'm sure they're literally scared for their life. But yeah, I find it really fascinating to learn exactly what the hierarchy of the Mafia families is like. And now we move on to some general quickfire Mafia facts. Italy built an entire courthouse to prosecute the Mafia. They charged 475 members in a trial that lasted from 1986 until 1992. To date, it is one of the biggest trials in history. me. 
making an annual income of $1.3 billion in today's money. Wow, that is a lot of money. And Al Capone is probably the most well-known member of the Mafia, even to people like me who know very little about it. I have at least heard of Al Capone and I'd actually really like to learn more about him so I imagine one day there could well be a fax video made about him so keep an eye out for that one if you're interested. As mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, Dennis Kucinich had a hit placed on him by the Mafia in 1978 for refusing to sell public utility company Municipal Light. The plan fell apart when Kucinich became ill and missed the Columbus Day Parade where the shooting was supposed to take place. Wow, it sounds like he got very lucky there, indeed, or he could well have paid the ultimate price and been taken out by the Mafia. In 1948, an Italian partisan named Placido Risotto was murdered by a Mafia boss. His body was hidden. In the 1960s, the boss was acquitted twice of Risotto's murder due to lack of evidence. Finally, in 2009, Risotto's remains were found on a cliff. In 2012, a DNA test confirmed they were his. In the 1990s, a Russian Mafia and Italian Mafia organization participated in a literal money laundering scheme, washing and bleaching the ink out of US $1 bills and reprinting them as $100 bills for use in the post-Soviet bloc countries where the bills might avoid detection as counterfeit. That sounds like a very time-consuming process. I can't imagine it was a lot of fun to do, but as we learned during the summary of the hierarchy, it was most likely the soldiers who took on this particular task. In 1985, New York Governor Mario Cuomo denied the existence of the Mafia when asked by reporters and called them a lot of baloney. This incident and Cuomo's rumored mob ties became a common explanation for him not running for president in 1992. Tattoos in Japan were banned from 1868 until 1948. Traditional Japanese tattoos were associated with the Yakuza as they were used to mark the skin of outlaws. To this day, they retain a stigma of criminality and many businesses still ban customers with tattoos. Undercover FBI agent Joseph Pistone led to over 200 indictments and over 100 convictions of Mafia members. The man who introduced Pistone to the Mafia was murdered for having allowed an FBI 
FBI agent to infiltrate the family. He was shot dead and his hands were cut off. Mafia leader John Cote and the Campino crime family use an area in New York City called the O as a mass grave for Mafia targets. Wow, I wonder, is that, as it sounds, literally just a huge hole that the bodies were dumped in? It makes me think about a scene in the movie Casino, if you've ever seen that, which I have seen in part, but I won't spoil it in case you haven't seen the whole movie, but there are two people who are beaten with bats in that movie and eventually buried alive in a sort of sandy grave and that fact just reminded me of that scene in the movie. And finally, Italian police officers posed as pizza delivery boys in order to arrest Mafia boss Roberto Mangiello of Naples' notorious Camorra Mafia, listed as one of Italy's 100 most dangerous criminals as he watched football in his apartment. He offered no resistance to his arrest. Hey guys, welcome back to another Whispered Facts episode. And today's video topic is a night that is celebrated every 5th of November here in the UK that is known by a number of different names depending on who you are and where you come from. But generally, it's well known as Guy Fox Night. Other popular names include Bonfire Night as well as Fireworks Night. So that is the plan for today's video. And as always, I will offer some of my own opinions and experiences throughout the video as well. So feel free to lay back, relax, and let yourself drift away as I whisper facts about Guy Fawkes Night. Guy Fawkes Night is an annual commemoration observed on the 5th of November, primarily in the United Kingdom. Its history begins with the events of the 5th of November 1605, when Guy Fawkes, a member of the Gunpowder Plot, was arrested while guarding explosives lauders and placed beneath the House of Lords. Celebrating the fact that King James I had survived an attempt on his life, people lit bonfires around London, and months later the introduction of the observance of the 5th of November Act enforced an annual public day of thanksgiving for the plot's failure. Within a few decades, Gunpowder Treason Day, as it was known, became the predominant English state commemoration. But as it carried strong Protestant religious overtones, it also became a focus for anti-Catholic sentiment. Puritans delivered sermons regarding the perceived dangers of Popery, while during increasingly raucous celebrations, people burned effigies of popular hit figures, such as the Pope. Towards the end of the 18th century, 
shirts and beard of children begging for money with effigies of Guy Fox and the 5th of November gradually became known as Guy Fox Day. Eventually the violence was dealt with and by the 20th century Guy Fox Night had become an enjoyable social commemoration. The present day Guy Fox Night is usually celebrated at large organized events centered on a bonfire often accompanied by a firework display. Yeah, so that's a quick sort of overview of what Guy Fox Night is and why we celebrate it. And I think if you were to ask the vast majority of people in the UK why we celebrate Guy Fox Night or who Guy Fox was, they wouldn't be able to tell you a whole lot about it, myself included. I think all I really knew before researching the subject was that it is held on the 5th of November every year. We have bonfires and fireworks, but why we have them I wouldn't have been able to tell you. So I really enjoy these Whisper Facts videos and picking up all this new knowledge that I didn't previously have, but I don't think it's limited to certain areas. I think it's probably the case for most seasons such as Easter, Christmas, Halloween, etc. I did a recent Halloween facts video and learned all these new and interesting facts about the festival. season theme fact videos in the future. I think if I end up doing these videos for however many months or years, my brain might explode with all the new knowledge. <laughs> so if I disappear off the face of the earth, I assume that is what's happened to me. <laughs> so yeah, Guy Fawkes Night is also associated with a number of rhymes and poems. These rhymes are another fundamental part of the celebration of Guy Fawkes Night. In certain counties, they are as integral to the custom as the burning of the guy and the lighting of the fireworks. The most well-known rhyme that is used to honor this ritual is the Remember Remember poem and it goes as follows Remember Remember the 5th of November Gunpowder, treason and plot I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot Guy Fox, Guy Fox was his intent to blow up king and parliament. Three score barrels were laid below to prove old England's overthrow. By God's mercy he was catched with a darkened lantern and burning match. So holler boys, holler boys, let the bells ring. Holler boys, holler boys, God save the king. Hip hip hooray. I think a lot of people know the first line of that rhyme, myself included. But I know personally the only line I think I would have known 
picture by picture comparison. Okay guys, so now I'm going to move on from the topic of Guy Fox and share some facts about fireworks themselves which play a very important part in the celebrations of Guy Fox Night. Elizabeth was so fascinated 
heaviest firework rocket is 13 kilograms and was produced and launched in Portugal in 2010. On the night, Ted Bundy was executed, an estimated 2,000 celebrants sang, danced and set off fireworks in a pasture across the street from the prison. Then cheered loudly as the white hearse carrying his body left the facility. I actually watched a video recently on Ted Bundy. He really was a wicked man. There's a video here on YouTube showing his final interview which was conducted the day before his execution. It's quite a fascinating watch if you're interested in that kind of topic. It's well worth checking out. But yeah, I can understand why so many would celebrate with fireworks and such after his execution as he brought so much pain to so many families. The word for firework in Japanese, Hanabi which actually means far flower. A rocket can reach speeds of 150 miles per hour and the shell can reach as high as 200 meters. A sparkler burns at a temperature over 15 times the boiling point of water Three sparklers burning together generate the same heat as a blowtorch. France uses fireworks to celebrate Bastille Day, to celebrate storming the prison of Bastille on the 14th of July, 1789. manufacture of fireworks must wear cotton clothing including undergarments synthetic clothing can create sparks capable of detonating fireworks <laughs> that sounds pretty dicey I'm not sure I would fancy working in a place like that <laughs> one spark in your crown jewels might just go you wore the wrong kind of underwear to work one day. <laughs> Might be the last day you ever worked. <laughs> the record for the largest firework display consisted of 66,326 fireworks and was achieved in Portugal in 2006. So I guess Portugal take their fireworks very seriously, holding a number of records for both the heaviest firework at 13 kilograms, I believe it was, and also the largest firework display. Italy was the first country to truly master an experiment with fireworks in Europe. They were the first to use shells for firecrackers to be loaded into cannons and shot into the air. Half of all firework injuries are to children under the age of 16. Yeah, you need to be extremely careful when it comes to kids and fireworks. I was always watched very carefully when I was young and was only ever to allowed to use sparklers when I had gloves on. Every year there must be a lot of firework related injuries and incidents so I'm sure it's an extra busy time of year for the fire services as well as hospital staff no doubt. annual fireworks display event in Europe is the International Festival Concert held in Edinburgh, 
Scotland, in which a million fireworks are set off in less than an hour. That's quite an interesting fact that in all of Europe, Scotland has the biggest annual fireworks display. I would not have guessed that. I would probably have guessed Germany or somewhere like that for reasons unknown, but it is in fact Scotland. At first, fireworks were only orange and white. In the Middle Ages, new colours were achieved by adding different salts. The hardest colour to create is blue. A string of firecrackers that went on and on, lasting 22 hours, marked the New Year's Day celebrations in Hong Kong in 1996. That's another interesting fact to note that we probably see the most fireworks around the world on New Year's Eve. While Halloween isn't celebrated in every country, and Guy Fawkes Night even less so, I think New Year's must be the prominent event to feature fireworks. You always see on the news here in the UK around dinner time on New Year's Eve, places that have already struck midnight around the world, and you get a glimpse of their fireworks displays and things like that. Places like the Far East and Australia, etc. Those displays are absolutely massive and stunning looking. And one final fact to give you on fireworks is that fireworks were actually invented completely by accident. It was a Chinese cook century who accidentally invented fireworks by mixing the common ingredients found in the kitchen at that time. Sulfur, charcoal and a salt substitute. The mixture was set alight and resulted in colourful flames that we have come to know as fireworks. Everyone knows the story 
which he was said to have warned colonial militia of the approaching enemy by yelling, the British are coming. This is actually false. According to history.com, the operation was meant to be quiet and stealthy since British troops were hiding out in the Massachusetts countryside. Also, colonial Americans still considered themselves to be British. Fact number three. The Olympics used to award medals for art. From 1912 to 1948, the Olympic Games held competitions in the fine arts. Medals were given for literature, architecture, sculpture, painting and music. Naturally, the art created was required to be Olympic themed. According to the founder of the modern Olympics, Pierre de Freddy, the addition of the arts was necessary because the ancient Greeks used to hold art festivals alongside the games. Before the art events were eventually removed, 151 medals were awarded. And I recently began to get into the Olympics in a big way. I think from 2012 onwards. So, as of the recording of this video, the last 10 years or so, so the last three Olympic Games, I've been very interested in and watched a lot of different events. Fact number four. One time, 100 imposters claimed to be Marie Antoinette's dead son. Oh my goodness. After the French Revolution, eight-year-old Louis the 17th, I believe that is, was imprisoned and then never seen in public ever again. His parents were executed in 1793 and afterward he was horrifically abused, neglected and left isolated in a prison cell in the Paris Temple. In 1795 he died of tuberculosis at 10 years old. That's a tremendous shame and no age to die at all. His body was buried in secret in a mass grave. Years later, dozens of men came forward claiming to be him because a bourbon restoration was a possibility and a successful claimant could then potentially find himself on the throne of France. So there were a lot of people came forward and they chanced their arm, you could say. I'm not sure if that's a phrase you've ever heard before, but it's one we use here. And it just means that someone's trying their luck, basically. Fact number five. Napoleon was once attacked by a horde of bunnies. Oh, this is going to be a fun one, I can tell. Once upon a time, the famous conqueror, Napoleon Bonaparte, was attacked by bunnies. The emperor had requested that a rabbit hunt be arranged for himself and his men. His chief of staff set it up and had men round up reportedly 3,000 rabbits for the occasion. When the rabbits were released from their cages, the hunt was ready to go. At least that was the plan. But the bunnies charged towards Bonaparte and his men in a vicious and unstoppable onslaught. <laughs> oh my goodness. And we were taught that Waterloo was the conqueror's greatest defeat. That's a very amusing one, I like that. Fact number six. Women were once banned from smoking in public. In 1908, New Yorker 
kitty mole guy. Not sure how to pronounce that one. It's spelled M U L C A H E Y. Was arrested for striking a match against a wall and lighting a cigarette with it. Why, you might ask? Because this was a violation of the Sullivan Ordin Ordinance, a city law banning women and only women from smoking in public. During her hearing at the district court, Mulcahy argued about her rights to smoke cigarettes in public. She was fined five dollars. Two weeks later, the Sullivan Ordinance was vetoed by New York City's mayor. So this was back in 1908. Yeah, women, they didn't have a lot of rights back then. So they couldn't even smoke in public, which is just crazy, if you think about it. Fact number seven. The government literally poisoned alcohol during prohibition in the United States. The U.S. government literally poisoned alcohol when people continued to consume alcohol despite its banning. Law officials got frustrated and decided to try a different kind of deterrent, death. They ordered the poisoning of industrial alcohols manufactured in the U.S., which were products regularly stolen bootleggers, by bootleggers, I think that might be, by the end of Prohibition in 1933. The federal poisoning program is estimated to have killed at least 10,000 people. That is just an absolutely gobsmacking fact. Like, I'm really surprised by this that they actually go to those lengths. I think some of the facts within this article are going to be very eye opening. Fact number eight. Captain Morgan actually existed. The face of the well-loved rum brand was a totally real guy. He was a Welsh privateer who fought alongside the English against the Spanish in the Caribbean in the 1660s and 1670s. His first name was Henry and was knighted by King Charles II of England. His exact birth date is unknown, but it was sometime around 1635. He died in Jamaica in 1688, apparently very rich. Fact number nine, using forks used to be seen as sacrilegious. Forks, the widely used eating utensils, were once seen as blasphemous. They were first introduced in Italy in the 11th century. These spiked spaghetti twirling instruments were seen as an offense to God. And why? Do you ask? Because they were artificial hands, and as such, were considered to be sacrilegious. Fact number 10. The Titanic's owners never said the ship was unsinkable. Despite what James Cameron's iconic 1997 film may have you believe, the owners never said that it could never sink. Historian Richard Hoyles said that the population as a whole were unlikely to have thought of the Titanic as a unique 
unsinkable ship before its maiden voyage. And I actually did a fax video on the Titanic not too long ago, and it is a very fascinating topic, and one that I'm likely to delve into deeper in the future. And I also have to say I do love the movie, the James Cameron 1997 movie. I think it's an absolutely fantastic film and probably the only movie three hours long that I could sit through without getting bored. Fact number 11. There were more than 600 plots to kill Fidel Castro. Yes, 600. The Cuban dictator was targeted to be killed by a large range of foes, including political opponents, criminals, and even the United States, among many others. Tactics included everything from an exploding cigar to a poisoned diving suit. My goodness, a lot of people wanted Fidel Castro dead. And I have to admit, I don't know a whole lot about him. I do know, I do know the name, but I really don't know too much about him. So I think in the future, I will certainly do a video on him because he's a well-known figure in history. And I would like to learn more about him. Fact number 12. Cleopatra was not Egyptian. Despite what you may believe, the last queen of Egypt wasn't born in Egypt. As best as historians can tell, Cleopatra the seventh, which is her formal name, was Greek. She was a descendant of Alexander the Great's Macedonian general, and this is a word I can't pronounce, but it is spelled P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. And perhaps the P is silent, so it could be Ptolemy. I'm not exactly sure.
was followed to school by her pet lamb. Oh, that's so cute. In the late 1860s, she helped raise money for an old church by selling wool from her lamb. And I have to say that so far, this is my favorite fact of the video. I think that is so cute that she had a pet lamb. And this is where it originated from. And she was an 11 year old girl. And she even helped to raise money by selling wool from the lamb. That is just so heartwarming. And I love that fact. Fact number 15. Richard Nixon was a great musician. The 37th President of the United States and the only president to resign from office actually was an extremely talented musician. He played five instruments in total. The piano, saxophone, clarinet, accordion and violin. So yeah, he was very musically gifted. Fact number 16. Lyndon B. Johnson gave interviews from the bathroom. I'm not sure I want to read this one, but here we go. This, for lack of a better word, unapologetic president gave interviews while using the toilet. Oh my goodness. Presidential biographer Doris Cairns Goodwood describes the impetus. He just didn't want the conversation to stop. That is a very random and amusing fact. Fact number 17. Ketchup was sold in the 1830s as medicine. Forget ibuprofen. In the 1830s, when it came to popular medicine, ketchup was all the rage. In 1834, it was sold as a cure for indigestion by an Ohio physician named John Cook. It wasn't popularized as a condiment until the late 19th century. I love ketchup, especially with chips. And I don't like brown sauce. If you've ever had that before, I'm not a fan of brown sauce or mayonnaise. So there are a couple of bonus extra facts today. Fact number 18. President Abraham Lincoln is in the wrestling Hall of Fame. Before the 16th president took office, Abraham Lincoln was declared a wrestling champion. Oh wow. The six foot four president had only one loss among his around 300 contests. He earned a reputation for this in New Salem, Illinois, as an elite fighter. Eventually, he earned his country's wrestling championship. Wow, so we are learning all kinds of new and fascinating facts here today. I never knew that fact at all about Abraham Lincoln. So yeah, very impressed with that. Fact number 19. July 4th is not the real American Independence Day. It is actually July 2nd because this is when the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia actually voted to approve a resolution of independence. July 4th, though, is when the Congress adopted the official 
official declaration of independence and most didn't even sign that until August and this is actually a fact that I knew about because I have done a video on facts about the Independence Day in America so that was one that I learned when I was putting that video together Facts number 20 Abraham Lincoln was also a licensed bartender Besides being a wrestling champ Lincoln was also a licensed bartender. In 1833, the 16th resident opened up a bar called Barry and Lincoln with his friend William F. Barry in New Zealand, Illinois. The shop was eventually closed when Barry, an alcoholic, consumed most of the shop's supply. Oh dear, never a good thing if you're running a bar and you end up drinking all the stock. It's quite a shame, really. I'm sure Abraham Lincoln wasn't too impressed when he found that out. Fact number 21. John Adams was the first president to live in the White House. While the White House was under construction during Washington's term, he never actually lived there. Interestingly enough, George Washington is the only president to date who has not lived in the White House. So yeah, we have a lot of historical facts about presidents included within this video. Fact number 22. The first face on the $1 bill was not George Washington. The first president was not the first face on the $1 bill. The first face to appear on this currency was Solomon P. Chase. The first $1 bill was issued during the Civil War in 1862. Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury at that time and was also the designer of the country's first banknotes. Fact number 23. Thomas Edison didn't invent a light bulb. I'm sure this is going to be a good explanation because all my life I've thought that he did. It was what was taught in school, but here is the explanation. While Edison did have an astonishing 1093 patents, the majority of these were not of his own invention. He stole most of them. Oh dear, that's not good. While he did land the patent for the light bulb in 1880, the real inventor was actually Warren de la Rue, a British astronomer and chemist who actually created the very first light bulb 40 years before Edison. Wow, I'm quite, quite shocked by this particular fact. Fact number 24. Betsy Ross didn't design and so the first American flag. At least the only proof we have of this is from Ross's grandson. William Canby, who claimed in 1870 that his Gam Gam had the idea. I wonder who Gam Gam is. The real creator was more likely to be Francis Hopkinson from New Jersey.
Jersey, who signed the Declaration of Independence, and also designed many seals for the U.S. government. And finally, fact number 25. soon for another video and goodbye for now.